chapter number 44. If your heart's been blessed already this evening, would you say amen? Amen. 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 I'll add my voice to that, and uh, they're not picking anything up or what? <laughs> Two mics. Oh, yes, this is an experiment that's going on. And they're trying to, I'm really special tonight. <laughs> Our sound booth asked me to wear two mics, so you're hoping to pick out which one is working, I guess, or which one is not. So yeah, that's, that's intentional. There we go. I tell you what, my heart's been blessed already through the singing of God's Word, of uh, the truths in God's Word, and wow, what we ended on. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I just think, I was up here playing, it's hard not to get choked up with tears, just to be able to sing God's praise, He's worthy of it, and to, to sing it with this group of people, and uh, people that have gone through difficulties, and uh, challenges, and heartaches, and some that have uh, very recently been uh, in, in the night season, if you would. Uh, but then to sing day by day, and with each passing moment. Strength I find to meet my trials here. Wow, what a special, special thing it was to sing that with you. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart, not only to praise God and to think about how good our God is, but also to think about God's people and how precious they are. And uh, you're precious. You're precious to God and you're precious to me. And I know you're precious to one another. Uh, you, stay, you stick around here long enough after services uh, to show that you, that you really care about one another and you like being around each other. And uh, I just think, man, uh, what it's going to be like in heaven when we can spend all the time together, all right, um, and uh, be with the Lord. So that's good. That's good. Isaiah chapter number 44, um, we have, you know, didn't have enough time for announcements. I'll probably give you a few uh, after, the, after the service, but I do want to uh, uh, invite you to stick around. We are going to have our first meeting, uh, at least official meeting, uh, concerning the building and uh, what we're thinking about and what we're praying. We've uh, printed a document that we want to present to the church, and uh, in that document it's kind of outlined uh, at least how the church leadership is, is going to, you know, what, what the guidelines or whatever you want to call it, the principles that we're going to follow. And we want to be held accountable, uh, not only to uh, the Lord, but accountable to you. And so we'll, we'll get that started. Maybe not have a ton of time for questions, but at least get, get it off the ground. And uh, I know you guys have been praying and asking uh, questions about that. But Isaiah chapter number 44, the title of the message this evening is, How Thirsty for God Are You? How Thirsty for God Are You? You. It's a question, and I hope you all ask, ask that question uh, this evening, because God makes some great promises. I know he's talking to Israel here, but I'm going to make spiritual application uh, to the church and God's people. We'll look at the interpretation and also some of the application as we get into this. But we'll begin here reading in verse number one, uh, and then I'll ask the church if you would join me when I get to verse three, and uh, we'll read verse three out loud together as a church. But verse number one, yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jesarun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. May God bless the reading of his word, and uh, let's, let's open up with a word of prayer and ask his help. Lord, we love you tonight, and uh, we love you because you first loved us, God, and when we were far away from you, you sought us, and, um, and you persisted, and you were patient, and you were long-suffering and kind. Lord, I know how, uh, just how kind you've been to me and how loving, and Lord, I know the testimonies tonight, even though... Uh, we weren't able to hear all of the details, Lord, just to be able to hear how you saved each and every one of us. And I want to say thank you for that tonight, God. And I pray, Lord, if that there's somebody here in our midst who doesn't have a testimony of salvation, Lord, I pray that they would see Jesus tonight, that they'd see him on the cross, dying there, Lord, not just for the world, but for them specifically, Lord, for the things that they've done and thought and said that have separated them from God. May they look to him tonight, not look to themselves, not look to some experience they've had, but may they believe on Jesus in their heart and know him like we know him, God. I pray that for them this evening. God, I pray for your help as I preach your word. 
Lord, as we think about this idea of uh, your blessing and pouring out water on him that is thirsty, make us thirsty, God, for you. Lord, I think sometimes we get so satisfied with the things of this world. We get so satisfied with junk food, if you would, and things, Lord, that are not good for us and not healthy and things that do not last while the living water, Lord, we, we pass. And uh, how parched we are spiritually, Lord. I think of our nation, our, our, our great nation, the nation that we love, Lord, our motherland, if you would, Lord, and how spiritually parched America is tonight. Lord, how sin is just drying this nation up faster than we, we can even believe sometimes. Lord, I think about our own county and some of the things that are going on in Lancaster County, things that, that there's folks here that have been around long enough who never thought we would see these things, Lord, and our precious children being sacrificed to these wicked, wicked people and these wicked ideas. God, I pray tonight for our nation. I pray for our church. I pray for our families. God, we need you. We need your spirit to be poured out on thirsty souls, Lord, but it needs to start with each individual heart here tonight, mine included, God. Help us to be thirsty for you. I pray that you would speak to us now as only you can. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And we've been looking at Isaiah 41, 40, 41, 42, 43, and we've seen over and over as God has reminded the nation of Israel just how precious they are to him and just everything that he's been to them from the beginning. I mean, they owe their existence to him. In the first few verses, he reminds them yet again, I formed you, all right? I made you in the womb, all right? And, and this is God coming to Israel and saying, look it, I've been everything to you, and uh, and." and you can count on me and you can trust me and you can rely on me. And yet Israel over and over and over again have proved themselves to be a people that just didn't, you know, they didn't get it. They, they just, they, they refused to believe in God, they re, in God's goodness and his care for them and his comfort. And you see that in Israel's history. They always seem to be a people that if everything just wasn't going perfectly in their life, they blamed God. They just had this idea that if somehow something went bad in their life, that God failed them, that God was not the creator, that he was not all powerful, because if he were all powerful, he would remove this thorn in my flesh, or he would have removed every, you know, hardship and every day of adversity would be gone. Or if God really cared, then he would have taken all this. He would not have allowed this to happen to us. He would have not allowed me to walk through this valley of the shadow of death. If God would was all powerful, if God was all caring, if God was uh, uh, who he says he was, he would not have done this. We see that. Remember right after he delivered them from Egypt, they got out into the, the wilderness and the minute they started feeling a little hungry, well, God just brought us out here to die. Right? I mean, come on now, right? Then they got a little thirsty and what did they say? Oh, God did this to us. We were better off back in Egypt. I mean, a, a little adversity, a little hardship, a little, you know, trial, if, or if you would, a tribulation. And Israel's response to, the, to, to anything that was not, you know, catered to their every wish and desired and, and anything that, 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 that just made them feel a little bit uncomf uncomfortable, their response was always like the problems with God. What's wrong with him? And, 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 you know, that's what has led them to this place now where God is, is prophesying that, hey, my heavy hand of judgment is coming. I'm sending Babylon, and they're going to wipe you out, and they're going to leave your land desolate. And you think, you think a little bit of trial for, you know, being obedient to me? You, th you think a little bit of hardship uh, that, that the world brings on you because you had to follow my ways and my laws? You think that was something? Just wait till Babylon comes. Just wait till you see what they will do to you. All right? And, uh, and, and then yet in this, God is still promising. He's saying, hey, look, I've got to send judgment on you. But I still care about you, and I'm still going to bring you out. These are the chapters in Isaiah that we've been looking at. He's given them promises, like, I will be with you when you pass through the floods. I'll be there when you walk through the fire. And again, as we think about Israel's history, when Babylon came, they, they went through great trials. 
Some of them passed through the fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah, they stayed faithful, and God was true to his promise. He was with them. We've seen these things. Now, what's really interesting to me is the fact that their land did not have to be desolate. Because Israel, the only nation in the world that God had made a covenant with and said, if you obey me, I'll bless your land. I'll make you fruitful. And he wasn't talking spiritually, friend. He was saying, look, you won't have diseases and you won't have uh, barren lands and you will not go through famine. This is the only nation in the world, by the way, that God has promised that to. He promised this to America. He didn't promise that to Russia or Africa or anything else like that. But he did promise it to Israel. If they would have just followed his law, they would have never had a famine. They would have never gone through a plague. They would have never had any kind of disease that would have touched them. That's a pretty cool promise. Think about that. They were going to be wealthy. God said, all you have to do is obey me. And so the fact that there were famines, the fact that there were plagues, the fact that there were all of these things that had come through on the land uh, of, uh, of Israel and the nation of Israel was just evidence that they were disobedient people. Yeah. Right? It, it, is that not true? And God had to judge them and punish them. You remember with Elijah, right? God finally had to say, hey, Elijah, get down there and tell him it's not going to rain for three years. Three years of, of famine. That's just one incident. That's just one example of how God would constantly have to come to Israel, punish them because of their disobedience to them, and they went through things that they did not have to go through. Hardships that they wouldn't have had to have gone through originally. So you add that into the mix, and it really is a head-scratcher that these people constantly forsook God. Now, as we think about this, you have to understand that in Israel's perspective, they looked out at the world and they saw how they were living wickedly and how their gods that, they, that the Philistines served and the Canaanite nations served and the Egyptians served. Those gods let Israel do whatever they wanted to do. Man, they could go out there and fornicate. They could go out there and enjoy whatever kind of music they wanted to, to enjoy. And they could enjoy whatever kind of entertainment uh, that they wanted to, to, to entertain themselves with. Those gods really let them live the life that they really wanted to, inside in their wicked hearts, wanted to live. And on top of that, they didn't seem to be punished. They were looking out at the other nations and they were thinking, wow, these people aren't doing right. But they're not going through famine. These people are not doing right. And God's blessing their flocks. They got lots of sheep and goats and chickens and camels. And they don't, they don't even have to live for Jesus. And here I am trying to do right. And it's hard. And so after a while, they're like, you know what? I think we need to worship the Philistine God. Baal was the God of rain. He was the God of the harvest, the God who would send the crops. And they were like, look, they're serving this, this God and their crops are growing better than ours. Let's go serve that God. All right? This is what's happening in Israel's heart and in their mind uh, at this time period through here. Now, along the way, at this particular time, they were uh, Judah had a good king, Hezekiah, and he was trying to uh, steer them in the right direction, but Hezekiah wasn't going to be around very long. And after he died, uh, of his sons after him just took the nation uh, right back into idolatry and wickedness and disobedience, and things went from bad to worse. And that brings us then to God's promises that he made. And in Isaiah 44... He talks about pouring out water on him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. Israel was no stranger to this type of terminology. In fact, many of their songs included this. And they had known that God had always provided water when they were in the most desperate of times. King David wrote in the Psalms, in Psalm 63, uh, when he was in the wilderness of Judah, he said, O oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee, my soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is, to see thy power and thy glory so have I, as I have seen thee in the sanctuary, because thy loving kindness is better than life, 
my lips shall praise thee. Uh, in Psalm 42, uh, one, another song of Israel says, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? You see, the, this, was, this terminology and this thinking, it was engraved into their minds. It was in their songs that they sang. Mind you, a lot of the Christian church, you know, sometimes we go, we open up the Bible and we sing showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need, mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead and we sing those songs and then we walk out on Monday and we forget about God and we do our own thing. We live for self and, and for temporary things, you know, it's, it's no different. We sing, we want revival. But do we really? Psalm 78 verse 15 said, He clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. Psalm 105, 41, He opened the rock and the waters gushed out. Could you imagine what that must have been like? I mean, sometimes I think in my mind, maybe, maybe a Becca did me wrong uh, when I was a child. And I, I get this picture of this rock, you know, and it's like somebody turned on like a little faucet or something, maybe like a hose bib, you know, it's like, but like there were 2 million people plus animals that had to be watered. All right. Um, a hose bib <laughs> would not have, would not have done that, especially if it was ours here at Gospel Light Baptist <laughs> Church, <laughs> you know, we're going to have to get that well fixed eventually. You know what I'm saying? I mean, when you read about the account in the Bible and the Psalms, and as I said, they said the waters gushed out. What a miracle that must have been to see as, as Moses, you know, of course he struck the rock when he was instructed to talk to it, but man, the waters just <laughs> on that thirsty land, that dry wilderness, a parched land. We saw this a little bit, and we didn't see water from the rock, but we saw this idea of parched land when we were out west. Boy, things got dry. I remember when I, I initially moved out to Utah. You know, we live right next to Lake Michigan, one of the largest freshwater lakes in the world. I mean, we had water to spare. We had water in the basement. We had water... You name it, we had water over there. I'd never even heard of finished basements because in, 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 in Indiana next to Lake Michigan, you didn't finish the basement. It was a lake down there. Uh, in fact, where I lived used to be under Lake Michigan like 100 years ago. All right, I guess it had receded or whatnot. And then somebody thought, hey, this would be a great place to build a house. We got out west and it did not rain for three months from the day I arrived, three months, that messes with you psychologically. It started messing with my mind. I began to think like, is this ever going to rain? And you would see everything dry up. River beds just completely, you know? And, uh, and, and, and I, I was began to catch on, like everybody was talking about how, the re how high was the reservoir and how, how, where was the line at and stuff like that. We didn't talk like that out in Indiana, you know? We didn't talk about like, who, what is a reservoir anyways? And everybody's talking about the snowfall and the snowpack and, and, and all this. You say, why? It was because water was a, a big deal out there, a lot bigger than it was here. Of course, I got a job doing irrigation and uh, I found out just how difficult it can be to keep a desert looking green. All right, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. And, and then they put restrictions on how long you can water. Those would come in. Those restrictions would come in. And somehow they'd still want the, the base to look green, but, you, you know, you get less half the time to water your, the parks and the lawns and everything. I know what it's like to, 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 to see dry ground and to see it parched and thirsty. But you know what? I also know what it's like to see spiritual lives that are dried up. They're dried up because the Spirit of God and that soul is not thirsting for God. That, 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 that fountain has been shut off. Mostly because 
People are seeking satisfaction somewhere else, just like the nation of Israel. Now, it's interesting. I want to read through some of this. We'll get to the message, hopefully, eventually tonight. But you, you read through, and it's always interesting to me how God is making a case for himself with Israel. You know, in the Bible, he really doesn't, you know, uh, uh, try to talk to the general population and make it a case for his existence. But with Israel, it's almost like he's trying to whet their appetite. He's trying to make them thirsty for him once again. And, and so he reasons with them and he says, look, look, I am God. Just because you're going through some hardship, that doesn't mean I'm not the creator. Over and over in Isaiah, he reminds them that he is the creator. He is the sustainer. Uh, he is the redeemer. In verse 6, thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his, and his redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Sound familiar? The book of Revelation records that over and over again. I am Alpha. I am Omega. I am the first. I'm on the last. You know who said that, by the way? Jesus. Jesus. Here's quoting Isaiah 44 here, and, and he's saying this is Jesus that was speaking uh, to Israel. Uh, who And who, as I, shall call and shall declare it and set in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, and let them show unto them, fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. I like that. God's like, hmm, I'm sitting up here. I'm thinking, no, there's no God. I don't know of any. Do you? <laughs> All right. This is what God's saying to Israel. He's like, hmm, I, I can't think of any other God. Can you think of one? All right. It's just me. It's just me. That's what God's saying. And then he talks about the the, the, the lost, the, the pagan nations around them. And Israel was getting caught up with this. Look at verse 9. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity, and their delectable things shall not profit. And they are their own witnesses. They see not nor know that they may be ashamed. Who hath formed a God or molten a graven image that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed, and the workmen there are of men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yea, let them fear. And they shall be ashamed together. The smith with the tongs both worketh in the coals and fashion it with hammers and worketh it with the strength of his arms. Yea, he is hungry and his strength faileth. He drinketh no water and is faint. God's pointing out here, here, here are the pagan nations. They're making their own gods and they're wearing themselves out doing it. And they're working so hard, they're even getting hungry. All right, now you know men, you put in a good day's work, you start getting hungry. Amen? It's just a, it must be a man thing. Uh, we, we work, we get done working, and all of a sudden it's like we want to eat. Say, well, I've been working. And these, these guys are, they've been working, they're building their gods. That's what they're doing. And they're, they're working so hard and, and they're, they're molding it and they're, 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 they're putting it in the fire the, with, with, to, to make the gold. And these, these, these gods they would make, they would fashion them out of wood and then they would, they would overlay them with gold or overlay them with silver. And so there's all these, there's fire and, and there's, there's working with the wood and then working with the metal. And I'm telling you what, I can just see in my mind's eye like a blacksmith sort of guy right and he's sweating his fire and wood and metal and he's working away and you know what he's doing he's making a god he's gonna worship this god he's gonna bow down before it and man now he's thirsty he's thirsty and you know what there's no satisfaction for him that's what god says there's no satisfaction for him it doesn't satisfy why because vanity you know, we, we read about that word vanity in Ecclesiastes a lot, don't we? You know, that word, the, idea, the, the, the meaning of vanity is, is it's like a cloud. You can see it. It's visible to the human eye, but you can't, you can't grab it. You with me? Now, you, every, how many of you have flown? How many of you have flown an airplane, right? Gone through the clouds, right? Yeah, you weren't expecting to hit the cloud and bounce off, were you? Like, oh, no, we're going to crash. No, you just go right through them. See, you can't build a house on a cloud. 
You can build a house on a rock. Amen? You can build a house on a rock, but you can't build a house on a crowd because it's vanity. You just like try to grab a hold of it, and it's cotton candy has got more substance to it than a cloud. And there ain't a lot of substance in cotton candy. It looks great big, you know, and you try to take a bite out of it, and it's like gone. Instantly crystal. But oh, that tastes so good. I digress. But this is what God is saying here. He's saying, look, their gods are vanity. They offer the hope or they, they, they give you a little bit like you can see them. It's, it's, it's visible to, the, to your human eye, but there's no substance there. There's no satisfaction. It can't meet your needs. It can't answer your prayers. All right? And when you die, it's not going to take your soul anywhere but straight to hell. Think about this. He goes on. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule. He marketh it with a line. He fitteth it with planes. And he marketh it out with a compass. And maketh it after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. And God's just scratching his head, right? It's like, why are you going to make your gods look like you? Right? The beauty of a man. He heweth them. And by the way, the Greeks and, and all the pagan nations, they're so infatuated with man and the beauty of man and the body. And, and America's no different. Um, you know, I've been trying to go down uh, to, to work out at Planet Fitness, and it just, it's just amazing to me. People are just worshiping their bodies. They are. Now, if you're worried about me, I'm just sitting in the, on, the, on the massage chairs that they have there <laughs> and the jet, and it's really good for my arthritis. <laughs> so I'm not worshiping the body. No, no, sir, I'm not. But I, I'm just there to get a little bit of relief from the pain. Anyways, he heweth himself down cedars and taketh the cypress and the oak. Ever cut a tree down? That's hard work. That is hard work. And maybe you didn't take it down. Maybe nature took the tree down. Ever have something fall on your property? I had a tree in Utah fell on the pilot. Smashed that thing up. And, and we had to get insurance and so forth. But you know what? It was a lot of work cleaning that tree up. Just trying to chop it up. I was helping brother, uh, this dear brother the other day, man, try to take that. I didn't want to name you, you know what I mean? Because there'd be some stories there. <laughs> That's some hard work, unless you've got a nice Kubota that you can drive around in, and it'll do all the work for you. The, here, here, it's sad when you look at the pagan nations and you see all the effort that they're putting in. And you know that when the moment comes, when they really need God, they're going to be ashamed. It's going to be more than ashamed. The terror when they need a redeemer. The moment's going to come when they're going to need a savior, when they're going to need a, a creator, an all-powerful creator, when they're going to need a loving God, a caring God. The moment's going to come in their life if it hasn't already come when they're going to need the long-suffering God of the universe that you and I know and love and have experienced. And instead of having that God, they're going to have some piece of, of, of vanity. But you know what's really mind-boggling is when Christians are worshiping that. When God's people, Israel, who had seen the water gush from the rock, when they're down there bowing their knee before that false idol, how confusing, how utterly incomprehensible is that? And I say to you today as God's people, it's no different. I scratch my head sometimes and wonder why God's people are living for temporal things that will not last. At the day of judgment, they'll be burned up. Uh, in a moment, they're going to be gone and they will not satisfy. And yet I see so many of God's people, whether it is not necessarily in this church, but some in this church, but across this country, who are bowing down to false idols. Then they put so much emphasis on things that don't matter. And it bothers me, and, and not just me. I'm standing behind this pulpit with the authority of God's word, speaking as God's man. God values this. 
God values Jesus. God puts a high priority on his church. God puts a high priority on your marriage and on your children and on your family. And he doesn't put a high priority on money and your retirement and on sports and on, on things that have no eternal benefit. And I wonder sometimes if God's people just don't get it. Because they're off chasing after all these things and they're neglecting God and Jesus and the church and their families and their marriages. Hear the voice of God. We read on. It says, Then shall it be for a man to burn, for he will take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it and baketh bread. I'd like to see that guy. I think that's why ladies came in. Amen. And made the bread. Now, some guys, there's some good cooks, but most of us guys, we really struggle in the kitchen. But here's this guy. He's worked hard. He's cut down a tree. And now he's hungry and he's thirsty. And so he begins to cook and bake bread. He maketh a God and worshipeth it. He maketh it a graven image and falleth down there too. He burneth part thereof in the fire. With part thereof he eateth flesh. He roasteth roast and is satisfied. Yea, he warmeth himself and saith, Aha, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the residue thereof he maketh a God, even his graven image. He falleth down unto it and worshipeth it and prayeth unto it and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my God. They have not known nor understood, for he hath shut their eyes that they cannot see and their hearts that they cannot understand. And none considereth in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding, to say, I have burned a part of it in the fire. Yea, also I have baked bread upon the coals thereof. I have roasted flesh and eaten it, and eaten it. And shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? He feedeth on ashes. A deceived heart hath turned him aside, that he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, Is there not a lie? In my right hand. And so here it is. Here's this fella. He's worked hard. He's cut down a tree. I have no idea how this is going to turn out. It's about to get interesting, folks. Right? There he is. He's gotten a tractor out. He's bulldozed it. He's cut all the limbs off. He's carved it down. He's worked hard. He's pouring sweat. The metal's burning, right? And the gold and the silver. And he's carving and working. And he, his face is getting black with the ash, right? And his hands are all crusty and dirty. Come on now, some of you guys looking at me. Uh, I know what I'm, a little bit of what I'm talking about, all right? I may be a little white collar now, but I, they're, I've done my time and, and worked in these things. Things. I know what it's like to work in a hundred degree heat in Utah and dig trenches and put irrigation systems in and man he's pouring sweat and he's hungry and and so here he is he's cutting the wood and he's cutting the wood and finally he's like all right man it's time to eat it's time to eat I'm gonna make me some food I'm gonna bake me some bread I'm gonna I'm gonna cook some meat praise the Lord he put that in the Bible amen right that's a, this is a real man this is a man's man it's not bread bread just doesn't cut it he he needs some barbecue and so he does he cuts it down and 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 he's like man throw a log on the fire throw a log on the fire and we're gonna we're gonna roast some meat Ew, psh, nothing wrong with that right into the fire it goes he cooks his food murm. he eats his fried chicken <laughs> yeah wow that's delicious and then he goes over to this he's like now I'm gonna make me a god And, and God says, you're going to bow down and worship this when you threw its cousin in the fire. <laughs> like you just threw his brother in the flames and you're, you're eating the bread. You're eating food. Uh, like, come on, man. You, you understand? I'm just trying to put this in simple layman's terms. This is how I see it. I, I hear God say, come on, man. You just threw half the tree in the flames and it didn't, it could do nothing except heat you and cook your food and now it's a pile of ashes. 
Meanwhile, you're over here working on the residue, the rest of the tree that wasn't taken, and now you're like, oh, tree. Oh, God. Oh, satisfy the longing of my heart. Take care of my family. Now, now I hope this is getting down to you, getting through to us. Amen? Oh, meet my needs. Comfort my heart when I go through hard times. That's sad. It's sad. God's, God's looking at this. And you know what? God's looking at our lives sometimes. And he's watching you. And you know, you, you, you got that almighty dollar. And you, you take it to McDonald's and you buy a hamburger with it. And then you go miss church so you can go make some more dollars. What are you going to do when you need your God to answer your prayer? You going to pray to it? Are you going to pray to your boss? Oh, boss. Help me. This is, this is what God's saying to Israel. God's like, you know, if you would see this, Israel, that's why he says, remember, remember these in verse 21, Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest, and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. You know, even these trees that they were making gods out of, the Bible says they're declaring the glory of God. Praise the Lord. Is not all creation showing the handiwork of the, of the loving creator God that we serve? God's saying to his people, he's saying, boy, I, I do so much more for you than this. I created you. I saved you. I removed your sins as far as the east is from the west. Why are you living for things that don't last? Why are you so caught up on ashes? Ashes, right? This is, this is a stark reminder for all of us to be able to see. And to be able to recognize if these trees could talk, you were to ask them, who is the one true God? Do you know what these trees would tell you? I'll tell you what they would tell you. They would say, Jesus is the creator God. And all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Amen. If these trees could talk, you know what they would declare? They would say, of him is all things. And by him doth all things consist. And he is worthy. And you know, if the stones could talk, you know what they would cry out and say? And by the way, they are talking. Hallelujah. And they are crying out. If the stars could talk and pray. Praise the Lord, they do. Now I'll just get to the meat of the message. Amen? When I think about thirsty, I want to ask tonight, are you thirsting for God for salvation? When you think about the Bible, you think about thirsting, God uses it as a picture of salvation throughout scriptures. John chapter number 4, verse 13, Jesus said unto the woman that was standing there by the well, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that the real salvation is an everlasting salvation? Aren't you glad that when Jesus saved you, you're always saved? Amen. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. The Bible says you can be saved and know it. You can drink of that water and have a well springing up in your soul of everlasting lasting life praise the Lord he is the God of salvation and 
Many of us were thirsting in a barren land like the songwriter wrote. I thirsted in a barren land of sin and shame and nothing satisfying there I found. Uh, and then he came, by the way, to, to Jesus where streams of living water did abound. John 6, 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Revelation 21, 6, and he said unto him, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Quoting Isaiah chapter number 44, verse number 6 right there. Boy, it's hard not to get excited about the fact that if you're thirsting for salvation, you can come to God, you can come to Jesus. Jesus, and you can be satisfied. Let's be reminded of that. Maybe there's somebody here tonight that is thirsting for salvation. Come to Jesus. The spirit and the bride say, come and whosoever will uh, 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 and, and, and come and let him that is a thirst come and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. Revelation 22 verse number 17. You think God wants to get across this idea that if you're thirsting for salvation, there is a well of water that you can drink from and it's not found right here, my friend. It's found in the old rugged cross and the Savior that died on it and shed his blood to pay for sin. How about this? Are you thirsting for preservation? You know, Jesus sustains us through this life, not just for salvation, but he preserves us through every situation. As I went through the Bible, and I, I, I can't keep you forever, but I went through this week, and I just thought about all the different scenarios where somebody was really in need of water. And one of, the ones, one of the first ones I came up with was a woman by the name of Hagar. She ran into a really situation that was not of her own doing. A couple of people that should have known better thought they would help God out. And, 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 and in so doing, and I don't know how complicit Hagar got in the situation, but I don't think she was very complicit at all, to be honest with you. But she bears a son to Abraham. Out of, out of wedlock, by the way. And then they married him off, I, I guess, but out of the will of God. Let's put it that way. And then she became the recipient of envy and jealousy. You ever, you ever been on, the, on that side of things? It's not fun, friend. It's not. Ever been at work? In the law, somebody got envious of your position? Maybe they got envious because you always seem to be happy. You'd think everybody would be happy for you in that situation, but it don't always work that way. It's sad how jealous people get sometimes, how envious they get, and the things that they'll do. And Hagar found herself. And you know what happened? She found herself in that circumstance, and she got thrown out into the wilderness, and she was going to die. She got so desperate that she put her son underneath a plant, and she walked away thinking he was going to die of thirst, and she started weeping, and she thought it was all over. And you know what happened? Jesus showed up. God showed up. God said, Hagar, I'm going I'm to preserve you. You're not going to die. This situation, full of envy and strife and backbiting. Hey, listen, you live this Christian life very long. You're going to be the recipient of somebody talking bad about you, backbiting you, uh, uh, running your character down and doing everything they can, it seems like, to just destroy your reputation. And you know what God says? God says, I'll keep you through it. He may not, he, he may not take away the hurt and everything. You, the Bible says, blessed are you when they, men revile you and when they speak all manner of evil against you falsely. He may, not, he, he may allow you to feel some of the pain, but he's not going to let it destroy you. He's going to preserve you through it just like he preserved Hagar. And pretty soon he opened her eyes and she saw the water, amen, and she lived. And God made a nation out of, the, uh, out of that young man, Ishmael. I thought about that. I thought about the children of Israel and how they came out of Egypt and they found some water, but it was bitter. And man, they thought, man, we're going to die. It's bitter. And how terrible that must be when I mean, you're really thirsty and you get something and, and only to find out it's poisonous. 
That's like a double whammy. That's a double discouragement, right? And God told Moses, hey, Moses, go cut that tree down. Throw that in the water. That'd, that'd be a hard command to obey. <laughs> cut the tree down, man, whoa. And God made the bitter water sweet. Isn't that wonderful that we have a God that can take the bitter things that happen in our lives and he can turn them and make them sweet? He can. You know, it's, it's tough to say. But you know what? God can take the health trials that you go through and he can make them sweet. He can make them for his honor, for his glory. He can take whatever difficult circumstance you're in because of righteousness sake or, or otherwise. He can make the bitter water sweet. I go through and I think about all the times in the Bible where there were people who needed water. Samson, uh, Judges 15, 8. I didn't realize this, but he got water from a rock too. Elijah at Mount Carmel when he was standing there all alone, nobody standing with him. And man, God sent down fire from heaven and we always focus on that. But you know what? God also sent rain. And the Bible says that Elijah, he was a, he was a man uh, subject unto like passions as we are. And yet when he prayed, God held the heavens right and didn't rain for three years. And then he prayed again and God sent rain. He sent the servant. He said, man, go see. The servant came back. I don't see nothing. He said, go back and look again. Amen. And the guy came back and said, I see a cloud about the size of a man's hand. And would you know that from that cloud came showers of blessing and the famine was over. We can go all through Israel's history and see how God had preserved them time after time in times of unbelief. 1 Corinthians 10, Exodus 17, Numbers, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, and times of chastisement. Uh, even here when, when they were in Babylon and, and it seemed like a desert was in between because there literally was a desert in between Babylon and Jerusalem. And God said, don't you worry about that desert. I can get you across that desert. I can make water come from that desert and that wilderness to be able to keep bring you home and I will bring you home. He'll preserve you. You're starting out on something new like Abraham. When God says, get up from your father's house and go into a land that I will show thee. And you know, Abraham got there and God showed him where to dig the wells. Where to get the water. God preserved him. When he was all alone. God took care of him. Are you restarting? Seems like you're going back to ground zero, starting from scratch again. God, take care of you. Are you thirsting for God and his preservation? Then lastly, I ask you this. Are you thirsting for God in your sanctification? John 7, 37. Let's turn there as we wrap the sermon up here and land the plane. Come on now, can I get a witness? If not, we might have to circle the airport a few more times. I'm getting thirsty, actually. I'm thirsty tonight. How thirsty are you for God? John 7. You know, I, I'm finishing up with this, but there's a, there's a connection here because when Isaiah was prophesying, Hezekiah was the king of Israel. And the Assyrians were coming and they were besieging Jerusalem. And there was a, there was a great famine, a great, great, great time of trial. Hezekiah took it before the Lord. God delivered them. But in preparation for the Assyrians attacking the city of Jerusalem, Hezekiah carved a tunnel. It's a little over a mile long. And he carved it out of sheer rock. They were desperate. They didn't know how much time they were going to have. They, the, 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 the workers worked night and day. And they started one at the, the Gihon Spring and the other in Jerusalem. And they went through solid bedrock. And they carved this tunnel from the spring into Jerusalem. Two, two groups. And they met perfectly right in the middle. And the water flowed from the Gihon Spring into Jerusalem to help preserve them from the Assyrian siege. And this water that flowed into Jerusalem, they built a pool 
there in Jerusalem, and they called it the Pool of Siloam. That's what they called it. It was, it was in existence in Jesus' day. Several events that happened in the life of Christ happened around the Pool of Siloam. And there was a feast that they had. There were seven feasts, but there were three of those feasts that the men, all the men in Israel were required to attend. And the third and final one of those feasts was the Feast of Tabernacles. They were all required. It happened in the fall. All the men would have to come to Jerusalem and they would build booths or tents. And they, it would remind them of how God had preserved them through the wilderness wanderings and had provided for them and had met their every need. But it also looked forward to the millennial kingdom when Jesus would reign and every man would dwell under his tent. The Bible says and the promises and they would say peace one to another. They'd have all their needs cared for. And on the last day of the feast, the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles would last eight days. That's the number of new beginnings, number eight. But on that last day, there would be this wild celebration. It would be a huge party. It was, it was a grand parade, if you would. And what they would do is the priest, the high priest, uh, and a train of Levites following him, they would leave the Temple Mount area where the temple was. They would cross the, across, uh, the city of Jerusalem, and they were carrying two silver pitchers of water. And they would come to the Pool of Siloam, and they would dip those pitchers of water into the pool of Siloam. And then they would carry them through the streets of Jerusalem back to the Temple Mount where they would be poured out as a drink offering before the Lord. And the whole time the people would be singing, the bands would be playing, the, 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 everybody would be dancing in a good way. It was just a great celebration. And in the middle of all of this, Jesus stands up. And you read here, in verse number 37, it says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Because that Jesus was not yet glorified. He's speaking of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and the sanctifying work that he would do in the heart of the new believer, the new creation, the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Ghost. And he was saying, wow, look, you know, you're here, you're celebrating this great feast, this great day, this reminder of how God took care of you and he preserved you, this water that's flowing through Hezekiah. So, by the way, I, I walked that whole mile through that thing and I got really claustrophobic. We were in a big line of us and the line stopped and I was, it was a little too, you couldn't like stand up and I had my backpack on and I, my, I'm squeezed like this. And that thought just entered my head like, if an earthquake were to happen or something and the two ends of this tunnel were going to be shut, like this would be a terrible way to go. I mean, it was horrible. We turned off all our lights. You could not see your hand in front of your face. We were deep in the heart of the earth, ankle deep in water, at times knee deep as it went through there. But you know that life-giving water that kept Israel alive, if you want to say, during the Assyrian surge when Isaiah was alive in Hezekiah. God was saying, hey, look, I'm here to preserve you. And out of your belly are going to come rivers of living water. The Holy Spirit of God coming from within so that no enemy that surrounds you can defeat you, can starve you, can kill you by dehydrating you. Are you with me? You are siege proof. That's what he's saying. Because the Spirit of God is satisfying and flowing from you. And that's a satisfied Christian life, friend. It's not vanity. It's real. And it's going to last into eternity. Because it's not like this stuff. This stuff get burned up. 
It'll keep you warm for an hour, maybe. I don't know, but Brother John could probably tell you better. Depends on what kind of wood it is, right? It'll cook your bread. Praise the Lord, it'll roast the meat. But it's not going to satisfy like the Holy Spirit of God is. It's not going to cleanse you from within. It's not going to impart to you the life of Jesus in your life. Are you with me? So I hope this message will be a blessing. Now, at the end of all of this, God gives in the last verse a wonderful promise to the nation of Israel. And he says, I'm going to send a deliverer. And his name's going to be Cyrus. This is, by the way, 120 years before Cyrus was even born. And when Cyrus was born, he was a nobody because the Persians were not ruling at that time. His dad was a, was a vassal king, all right? And he, Cyrus would be used by God to not only conquer the Medes, but eventually he would conquer the Babylonians, the same ones that had destroyed Israel and were holding Israel captive, including Daniel. It was going to be Cyrus who was going to give the decree that the children of Israel can return back to their land. And Cyrus is actually going to help pay for it and use the money that's all doing this. And God's saying, hey, you know what? Let me, get, let me just whet your little appetite about how I can take care of you. I'm going to tell you 120 years before any of this stuff happens, the exact name of the guy who's going to deliver Israel, who's going to bring you back home, who's going to let you rebuild your temple... Pretty, pretty fascinating stuff. Only God can do that. Amen? Only God can do that. By the way, Cyrus was known as the shepherd king. Because when he was a little child, there was a king that heard about him, had a vision, and a prophet told him that Cyrus was going to overthrow him. And so he gave out a decree that he wanted him killed. And it was a shepherd who took that little boy in and preserved. Any of this kind of sound familiar? It's almost like a prophecy of King Jesus one day. Cyrus himself, a type of Christ in many ways. Fascinating stuff. The last verse of this chapter. Boy, you can trust God. That log over there, it can't do that. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And I thank you for these people, Lord, to hear your word. Bless us now, Lord, as we think on these things. Stir us, Lord, to remember, Lord, you're, you're, you're so worthy. You saved us. You've redeemed us. Lord, you provided for us. You preserve us through every situation, Lord, whether it be chastisement, whether it be uh, on the end of suffering, Lord, or at the end of uh, 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 envy and strife and jealousy at the hands of others, whatever it might be, hurts that we have felt, Things that have been said against us, Lord, we know that you can preserve us through all of those things. If we'll look to you, allow the Holy Spirit of God to impart into us the life of Jesus. With heads bowed and eyes closed, we'll give a time of prayer, just a few minutes. But I hope we'll take these things to heart. As the instruments play, the altars open. I'm taking down these idols. How thirsty are you for God?
All right, praise the Lord. And in a minute, I'm going to close with a word of prayer. And then um, we'll have a, just a few minutes. That way, if you need to, to leave, um, we can let those that need to go, go. And then we're going to have a, a brief meeting. We'll try not to take too long. 